Welcome back to day two of the National Archives Virtual Genealogy Fair. Before we introduce this speaker for this session, I'd like to let you know that well, there's one more hour that the hotline will be open. It'll be open till 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is where archivists are waiting to take your call uh, when you have questions about family research, sometimes you need a little bit of help on that, and this is where you can go. Here's the toll-free number, 1-855-309-8404, 1-855-309-8404. Our sixth uh, session today is entitled Genealogy Through Navy Deck Logs by Mark Milan. At the end of Mr. Milan's session, he will be answering questions. You can at any time send those questions in live to Ustream and Twitter. If he doesn't have time to cover all of your questions, please feel free to direct your questions to inquire, I-N-Q-U-I-R-E, at NARA, N-A-R-A, dot G-O-V. <coughs> Navy deck logs. After you've researched the basics of Navy personnel records, see what genealogical nuggets you can glean from the log books created by the U.S. Navy. And learn about the exciting ways the National Archives is making these available. Mark Milan is a Navy Maritime Reference Archivist with the National Archives, where he's, he has worked for 13 years. He is the author of two articles published in the National Archives publication prologue entitled the Army, Medal of, the Army Medal of Army, the first 55 years, and the second one, Honoring Our War Dead. The Evolution of the Government Policy on Headstones for Fallen Soldiers and Sailors. Mark is currently working on two projects, including the digital imaging of U.S. Navy and Coast Guard logbooks, as well as developing a website to facilitate access to studying logbooks of all kinds in the holdings of the National Archives. Mark? Thank you very much for that very nice introduction, uh, Nancy. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to be part of NAR's first vir virtual Genie Fair, and uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, and thank you for that uh, nice introduction. Just one quick uh, correction. Uh, the title of my article was the um, Army Medal of Honor, the first 55 years. Uh, that was a typo on my part. I take full responsibility. Um, and uh, so let's go ahead and we'll start off my uh, presentation this afternoon. <clears throat> Log, U.S. Arctic Steamer Jeanette, Navy Yard, Mare Island, California. Lieutenant George W. DeLong commanding. Thursday, June 26, 1879. 8 p.m. to midnight. Hazy weather, fresh breeze from south by southwest. Standing down San Francisco Bay. Jerome J. Collins and Raymond L. Newcomb were this day enlisted in the U.S. Naval Service as seamen for special duty during the cruise of this vessel. By order of commanding officer of rate of Walter Lee, Coppersmith was changed to machinist with pay of $50 per month to date from today. Signed, William Nindman. Log, U.S. Arctic Steamer Jeanette. At anchor, San Francisco, California under command of George W. DeLong, Wednesday, July 2nd, 1879. Meridian to 4 p.m. Strong breeze from south, weather pleasant. At 4, received aboard 30 cases of alcohol. By orders of C.O. G.W. Boyd, coal heaver was this day rated second class fireman. Signed, William Dunbar. Charles Tong Singh. This day enlisted in the U.S. Naval Service as seaman for the cruise of the USS Jeanette. His pay to be $35 per month. Signed, Charles W. Chap, Lieutenant and Executive Officer. Log, U.S. Arctic Steamer Jeanette. Anchored to a flow near Herald Island. Sunday, September 7, 1879. 8 p.m. 
to midnight, clear and pleasant, light breeze from the northeast until 10 when it became fresh and shifted north to northeast. Ice in motion pressing on board, pressing on starboard beam and giving ship bliss to starboard. A bear approached the ship and hastily retreated. William Endeman. I just read to you three entries from the logbook spanning the early days of the voyage of the USS Jeanette. Two with valuable genealogical notations reflecting the naval careers of several crewmen, the signatures of the officers of the, of the deck maintaining the log, and one notation that provides some context and even some levity in what would become a dire situation. Three days after that last entry that I read, the USS Jeanette would become trapped in ice would be trapped in ice for the next 21 months, drifting past the islands off the coast of the northern Siberia. Now, I've been very fortunate of late to be working on several projects relating to Navy deck logs. There we go. They can be a rich source of drama, as well as great genealogical information, as the logs of the USS Jeanette attest. But in order to delve into the logs and study one's genealogy, one must first know the ship that he or she, and later she, served on, and also the time frame in which he and she served on the ship. And this can be found in several ways. First, when researching your naval personnel, um, first place to start is the official military personnel file. Um, where's our... So in 18... The official military personnel files that are located in St. Louis for naval personnel and listed crew members start in 1885 and the files for officers start in 1903. Uh, prior to this time frame other sources of information can be found in pension files, uh, Navy pension files which are now available through our partnership with fold3.com. Uh, also research into muster roles uh, for mostly for enlisted men as well as for officers on microfilm publications M330 and M1328. Uh, those are abstracts of officers' services for the U.S. Navy. And those are wonderful places where you can go to find information about those who served in the Navy, what ships they served on uh, as a starting point. But after you have done some research and you know what vessels your subject of study has, has served on and the time frames, then it's time to delve into the logs and see what you can find. Here at Archives One uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, two main sources of log books uh, are, firstly, the logs and journals kept by USN officers in RG45. This is a relatively small collection of 250 volumes or so um, that are some of the more important log books that were used by the Naval Records and Library. Uh, however, the bulk of our logbooks is found in Record Group 24 and Entry 118, Logs of the U.S. Naval Ships and Stations 1801 to 1940 are located in this building. Navy deck logs after 1940 are located in our facility in College Park at Archives 2. Okay. Now I'd like to give a moment and talk about the origin of the term of logbook. Um, what you see on the screen is a device called the chip log in the lower left-hand corner is the chip log tied with a log line. This was a tool that was invented in the late 16th century for measuring the speed of a vessel, which was necessary information for navigating an open ocean. And how the device works was that you would throw the chip log, the crewman of the vessel, would throw the chip log overboard in the aft of the ship and count the knots that were made in the log line. And every 42 feet, there was another knot. And so for during the passage of a certain amount of time, the crewman would count the number of knots that passed by, and that would be the speed of the ship. And so that is the uh, origin of the term of the nautical speed, or knots. And then after that, a, f a few calculations, that number would be written down into a book, which was known as the log book. And so this was the speed of the vessel that was kept track of. 
and um, with the logbooks that I worked with, that speed was kept uh, on an hourly basis throughout the day. All right. Okay. So in the holdings here at Archives One, um, there are basically three eras or time frames of logbooks for the U.S. Navy. 1798 to 1815 is 1850. Uh, that time frame has a wide variety of information that's available in the logs, but as time goes on, uh, the logbooks become more standardized, uh, more detailed information about the crew members are available, such as in the 1860s to 1915, with the establishment of the Bureau of Navigation in the 1860s. Uh, more information is included about the service of crewmen as well as the list of officers is found in the beginning of the logbook. And then from the period 1916 up through the 1980s, it's a pretty standard format uh, for the logbooks with increasing amount of information uh, about the crew members, uh, save for wartime and World War II where there's less information in detail, but outside of wartime you can find more information generally. Now, if you know the vessels that your subject served, uh, the least information that a logbook can provide is twofold. The locations of the voyages that your ancestor sailed to and what they, and some of, a little bit of the experiences that they had in those ports. And then also the naval mission in which your ancestor was playing a part, whether that was protecting commercial shipping around the world, whether it was part of a military campaign in the War of 1812 or the Mexican War, scientific expeditions such as the exploration expedition of 1838 that reportedly discovered Antarctica and explored several island chains in the Pacific, including diplomatic missions such as Perry's opening of Japan or slave interdiction off the coast of Africa or blockade squadron duty off the, co the Confederate coast during the Civil War. All these important roles in US history and are researchable through the logs and vessels that conducted these missions. All right, so now early logs generally provide ju just this, the locations and some context of the, the mission that the vessel was involved with. And here, if, as an example, is a deck log page for the HS, USS, I'm sorry, USS Constitution, uh, dated August 20th of 1812. Described in these pages is, is the battle with HMS Guerriere uh, during the War of 1812. And in addition to the dramatic battle description, it includes more typical information, including weather, water depths, exercises conducted by the crew, vessels sighted, and uh, also typical genealogical nuggets include some disciplinary actions against the crew. And in the case of this page, it also gives the injuries of many crew members uh, as a result of the battle with HMS Guerriere, as well as uh, who received the prize uh, for the capture of the vessel. As time goes on, more information about individuals and crew members can be found in the pages of the deck logs. During Civil War, Congress authorized the establishment of what would become the Bureau of Navigation and logbooks that increasingly standardized to include lists of officers in the front of the logbook. And more information about the officers and enlisted men can be found on the entries inside. Here we have an example of the page of the USS Jamestown from October of 1867, stationed in Sitka, Alaska. The vessel was there to oversee the transfer of authority of, of Alaska from Russia to the United States. And I'll read a, a section from, uh, from the logbook. Uh, as you can see at home, it's in the uh, fourth paragraph, the rather larger paragraph. USS Jamestown, meridian to 4 p.m. Cloudy weather and light airs from north and east. John C. Stevens to land troops at three hours 30. The Russian flag was hauled down from the government house. 15 minutes later, the U.S. flag was hoisted. U.S. steamer Ossipi saluted both flags. Surgeon D. Bloodgood reported for duty this day. Signed, A. Fairbanks, mate. So in this short entry, one can see mention of three members of her crew who were uh, who were uh, witnesses to this historic event. All right, fast forwarding on. Um, now to the more 
the later log books that are in our holdings from 1916 and later to 1940. I took the opportunity um, in my own private time to uh, research some entries of the service of my great uncle, Thomas C. Green. I didn't have a lot of information when I first started. I knew that he graduated from the Naval Academy in 1927. I knew that he served on several ships, and I knew some of their names, as you can see on the screen. I knew that he ended his career also in 1947. Now, when I started my research back in 2006, I attempted to write to St. Louis to get a service record. However, this fell within the 62-year rule, so I had to wait a few more years before I could get that file. But luckily, I had enough information that I could trace much of his career through the logbooks in our holdings. So here, and I'll, I'll just make an, uh, a quick statement that uh, all the blue markings are mine, and they're only digital. They are not on any original paper, so there's no defacing of any of our documents. Um, and it does look like uh, uh, my five-year-old son might have circled them himself, but that's, that's my own uh, PowerPoint uh, skill set that you see right there. But we see that he served on the USS California. You can see this is the first page of the logbook. Uh, you see the commander. Uh, you can also see that it was the flagship to the U.S. battle fleet. And you see the time frame and that it was in San Francisco Bay. Now, all of these logbooks have a list of the officers in the front of the, of the logbook. Here we can see the entry for my great uncle, T.C. Green. He came on as an ensign. You can see his rank. And then he reported for duty 26th of August, 1927. And he was a junior officer with the W Division. And uh, so this was his first entry onto a ship after graduating from the academy as a junior officer. And so knowing, seeing from that page that he reported for duty August 26th, I could go forward to the logbook for August 26th and find his name in this paragraph, rather large paragraph in the middle. And I wanted to take a moment to um, read to you some of that paragraph, um, just to give you an idea of all the genealogical information that one can find. So if you'll bear with me. 8 to 12, anchored as before. 800, the USS Reno underway and standing out. 820, publish the deck courts of the following named men. Bevins L, private, USMC, offense, away without leave. Specifications approved by plea and sentenced to lose 70 cents per month of his pay for a period of one month. Approved August 25th, 1927. Gordanier, B, Seaman, second class, offense, AOL. Specification proved by plea and sentenced to lose $1.20 per month of his pay for the period of one month. Approved 25 August, 1927. 845, Young, CN, reported aboard for duty from USS Reno. 900, Ensign, JB, Stefanik, USN, detached from his ship for duty on board the USS Chalmont. Mustard on station following absence. Gregory T.M., Morgan J., McKechnie, H.B., Goosey, D.R., Sewell, D.M., Murley, J.G., Gallatin, G.W., Morrison, J.C., Katz, J., Dueling, F.X., were mustered on station and were, and were the absentees for the day. At 10.07, USS Ogorma, Ogorma came aside. At 1010, El Gorma shoved off from alongside the lighter YE35. Held daily inspection of magazines, conditions normal. Following name men were reported on board from the recruiting ship San Francisco for assignment by the Commander in Chief Battle Fleet. Akina N, uh, machinist attendant, first class. Baltanado N, machinist attendant, first class. Daldado D, and Barra Quattro R, machinist attendant, first class. Following name men reported on board for duty aboard the um, recruiting ship, San Francisco. Diversion J, musician second class. Ensign Dorch, Ensign Cooper, Ensign Bennett, Ensign Kahn, Ensign Leahy, Gazzy, Smith, Sollers, Nicholson, Outerbridge, Green, Stanley, Bowling, Beasley, Hickox, 
Zahn, Hardison, Donahoe, Bailey, reported for duty. 1155 USS Navigator came alongside with lighter YC269, signed GF to Grav. Now, if any of you are still awake, um, I counted 40 names in that one paragraph alone uh, with uh, mentions to debt courts, with being away without leave, changes in pay, reporting for duty, being transferred elsewhere. And so these are the kinds of nuggets that you can find in the logbooks that, you, that allow you to, attract one's, to track one's career. All right, so moving along. And I could continue to track his career. Here's the logbook for USS California, uh, the first page. And there he is again in the list of officers. And I have circled again. T.C. Green, Ensign, reported for duty, 26th of August, 1927. Here it's shown that he's being transferred to the Naval Air Station in, uh, in San Diego for December 2nd, 1927, where he would spend the next two months. Later on in his career, he served on the USS Pittsburgh. There he is again, T.C. Green, Ensign, so with um, reporting for duty in December of 1929. Here we are at the USS Manley with a list of officers, T.C. Green. Now he's been promoted to Lieutenant J.G. Uh, date of report of duty on this ship was uh, August of 1931, and he's the communications officer. And here we are, another entry in the USS Manley, moored as before, 930 held quarters for the muster. And on that last line at 10.08, Lieutenant J.G. Thomas C. E. Green, U.S. Navy, reported on duty for, for duty from the USS Pittsburgh. So you can see transfers, you can see promotions, and a lot of things. This was the most exciting, I think, to me, was that uh, while he was aboard the USS Manley, he had turns being the officer of the deck and entering the information into the logbook himself. And so I got to see his signature and see the exact paper that he signed with his own hand, which was quite a thrill. And here we are again with the USS Erie later on in his career. Um, I'm gonna take a pause here. So here is the first logbook page for the USS Erie. And studying the USS Erie, I learned that it was part of the Special Squadron in the late 1930s. And it was conducting drills and training maneuvers with submarines and other vessels that would, uh, would, for maneuvers that would be used later in World War II. So just from this page, I was in a little bit of research, I was able to find out what kind of role my uncle would play in World War II and how he helped prepare. In 1939, he transfers to the Naval Academy, where he teaches for two years. And for me in this building, my trail ends. Here he is. He shows up again in the list of officers for the logbook. Uh, he's a Lieutenant JG. He's a gunnery officer, second division officer, education officer, watch officer. He was a busy guy. And before I took on this project, if someone had asked me if um, I had ever seen a photograph in a logbook, the answer would have been no. And my 10 years of working with Navy records that had been the case until I took on this project. And you never know what you're gonna find until you start looking. And in this, in the first pages of the USS Erie, I found reports of the commissioning of the ship, which happened in 1936. And here actually is a vessel, uh, a photograph of the vessel during its commissioning. And you can see in the back of the vessel that there is a, um, a canopy in the back, right in the back of the vessel right here, and that was to protect the people uh, from the sun or the weather during the uh, commissioning ceremony. And so these are the days before in preparation for its commissioning. The next page, which I did not include in my presentation because it was very fuzzy and, and did not look good, um, but it was a, actually a photograph of the commanding officer with a number of officers behind him as he was addressing the commissioning ceremony. And um, so I, I'm on the hunt to see if I can find out which one of the uh, officers standing behind him might be my uncle 
standing behind the officer giving the uh, commissioning speech. Okay. Now, one question that is always asked of me after I talk about some logbooks is do I have to come to the Washington area in order to see the logbooks? And uh, thankfully, the uh, answer to that question increasingly is no. Uh, thankfully, with a, due to a, uh, a collaboration with our friends at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, we are working together to digitize uh, logbooks of the U.S. Navy and the Coast Guard and posting them online. Um, so let me talk about that for a minute. Some of those images that are going up online include uh, U.S. Revenue Cutter Bear. Uh, here you can see a typical page on the left-hand side that um, shows the weather that is uh, the weather recordings that I talked about. Here you have the hours of the day and then the knots and the fathoms. And here are the uh, weather notations here for the air temperature, the water temperature, the barometric pressure. And then again, this is the afternoon uh, data that was taken for the weather. And here is the use of coal and other kinds of information here. And on the right-hand side, we have uh, the operations page. And so you have the entries in hour blocks uh, from midnight to 4 a.m., 4 to 8, etc. And then you have the signatures of the officers uh, who are on deck making the entries. And so included, so I'm going to take a quick jaunt here, talk about our partnership with um, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Two years ago, I received a call from uh, my now colleague, Kevin Wood, who works for NOAA. And he called with an idea asking uh, if we could collaborate on digitally imaging uh, the logbooks for uh, the US Navy and Coast Guard so that they could take the images and post them online at this website that I'm showing you now called oldweather.org, where citizen scientists across the planet, uh, about 10,000 of them, are reading the pages that we're digitizing here in this, in this facility and having them post them on their website so that these 10,000 people can transcribe the weather data of the Navy and Coast Guard deck logs so that they can run weather reanalysis to better understand weather patterns uh, going back to the 1840s and 50s all the way up to our holdings up into 19, the late 1970s. So that was a very exciting project that these logbooks that are generally used for historical and genealogical study could also be used for current scientific study as well. So we left at the opportunity, and uh, as you can see, the logbook pages of these vessels as they scroll past, here's USS Yorktown, there's USS Vicksburg, uh, are going up on these pages, and people around the world are transcribing them to make it into data that uh, NOAA can use. And on our end, after they have posted the logbook pages on their site, we are able to post them on our website. So here we go. If we come to our NARA website, www.archives.gov, we can click on Research Our Records. Then we can click Online Catalog. And yeah, I'll give feedback later. <laughs> and if we type in Navy, Deck logs. Got that right. Keep our fingers crossed. There we are. Then we come to this page, and hold on. Let me just make a quick. Hmm. Bear with me. I'm sorry. You don't want to type in Navy log, log deck logs. It's Navy log books. I apologize. So type in Navy log books into the search engine. 
and you'll come up with in the second box where it says 84 descriptions, logbooks of US Navy ships, 1801 to 1940. And you can scroll down here, details, includes 208 files described in the catalog. Click on that. And now we can come to view all online holdings. There we go. And so now we can see some of the examples of the logbooks that I talked about during my talk. Here we have the USS Jamestown, who, were present at, who was present at the uh, transfer of the uh, Alaska from Russia to the United States. And here is the USS Bear, before it was the uh, revenue cutter Bear, uh, arguably the most famous Coast Guard cutter ship in history. And here we have the logbook pages of the USS Jeanette, of which I quoted from earlier. And why don't we take a look at those? So now, visiting our own website, you can delve in and take a look at these very logbook pages. And at home, you'll be able to zoom in. And there. So here you can see the weather readings that are taken on the left hand side. And here you can see the notations that are made on the right-hand side. So I invite you to visit that website and check out those links and view all those web pages for yourself. And uh, that'll conclude my talk. Thank you very much. And um, I'll be taking questions if there are any. Thank you, Mar Mark. You have several questions. Uh -oh. The first one probably is no surprise, but the Archivist of the United States has written in and asks, where would I start looking for the birthplace of the United States Navy? Hmm, that's a very good question. Um, in that it was a colonial navy, I would start with the records of uh, local state archives of the place you suspect the uh, navy was born, or wherever, whatever state. Uh, Many of the states outfitted their own smaller naval forces. So you want to check with local state archives. Thank you, Mark. The next question, are you digitizing or working with the Marine Corps records, especially those of World War II? There is uh, an effort afoot out at Archives II um, to digitize. I, I believe the US Marine Corps muster rolls are available online through our partnership with Ancestry.com. And again, those are available free at any NARA research facility across the country, uh, including presidential libraries. Um, and I believe there is a, an effort afoot to move ahead with a project on World War II Marine Corps. I'm not privy to all the details. But if you write to inquire at NARA.gov, we should be able to answer that question. Thank you. Are there records available for Bainbridge Navy Training Center? Uh, there, sh there should be. It depends on the time frame and, and let's see, the, a training center. I was raised myself in Orlando, Florida, for which there is the Orlando Naval Training Center at, at the time when I lived there. And uh, those records would be much more modern in scope. If we had any, they would probably be at Archives 2. I don't know when the training center was uh, established. But uh, if it was prior to World War II, then we should have records here. Uh, but it also could be at a local facility and wherever the Bainbridge Training Center was, was built, it could be at the local NARA facility. So you might inquire there as well. Thank you. Do you have the World War II logbook of the DD-510 USS Eaton at College Park? And we probably should invite that reader to send that question to inquire at nara.gov. That's right. If, if, if we do have it, it will be at Archives too. Is there a date range after which the Navy logs and other docs are not available? Well, the, the closer you get to present day, then the more records that are not available here through NARA. Uh, they're still under the legal authority of the US Navy. So if there are records that were recently created, then you might want to contact either the records officer for the US Navy if, they, if it turns out that we don't have the records at Archives 2. 
Thank you. And the next question, have logbooks of any of the very early submarines been digitized yet? Uh, no, not to my knowledge. Not, not in a project that uh, is associated with NARA, but uh, we do have logbooks for early submarines. And if, if anyone wants to take on a project, we can see what we can do to work with them. My father, and this is our last question, my father served on a landing craft or LCT in World War II. Were there any logbooks or records? That's a very good question. Um, there are some records of that type out at Archives too, but if I remember correctly, there are few. There are, those were generally small vessels, but I, I don't want to misspeak, and I would have you contact our expert at Archives too who would know much more about World War II records than I do. If, um, I do know that if it was an LCT that was manned by a Coast Guard crew, then we would have the muster rolls here because we do have US Coast Guard records here from its creation in 1790 to uh, 1980s. So if you know that bit of information, we may have the muster roll here, but if it was not a Coast Guard manned crew, then your best bet is to try archives too. Thank you, Mark. For those of you who didn't get your question answered or need follow-up, please feel free to write to inquire at nara.gov. And those messages go into a, a bank that then gets sent out to the appropriate archivists and specialists to answer across the NARA nation. So that concludes this, this lecture. At 4 o'clock, we will be hearing from Marissa Louis. She is, we had a, a short emergency, and Sue Karen is unable to present today, but Marissa Louis will be doing her, her lecture for her, and the title is, Oh, the Stories They Tell, Chinese Exclusion Act, case files at the National Archives and Records Administration. So we'll see you at 4 o'clock. Thank you.